I welcome Dr. Seema Manjari sir in today's program, Dilemma and Scientific Career. I also welcome all the participants who are live on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the volunteers who are present on WebEx Cisco. Aske program me aaj sabhi ka number swagat hai. Program ke shuruat me karna chahunga adarniya Sri Kumar Bhandari sir ka introduction se, jo mujhe jimadar di gayi hai. डॉक्टर सिंह कुमार बनर्जी एक ऐसा नाम ऐसा व्यक्तित्व कि शायद जिनकी पहचान शब्दों से व्यक्त करना आसान नहीं है भारत में नहीं पूरे विश्व भर में उनको कौन नहीं चाहते उनके अलग अलग डायमेंशन व्यक्तित्व के अगर मैं बात करूं टेक्निकल साइड पे तो वो हमारे भूतपूर्व बी आर डायरेक्टर रह चुके हैं चेयरमैन ए एंड सेक्रेटरी टू डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एनर्जी रह चुके हैं साथ में उनको भारत सरकार ने पद्मश्री का अवार्ड दिया है जो कि बहुत ही बहुत बड़ा अवार्ड है उनको इस क्षेत्र में काम करने के लिए शांति स्वरूप भटनागर का प्राइज भी मिला हुआ है और वो देश विदेश की अनेक यूनिवर्सिटीज में एज अ फैकल्टी उनको बुलाए जाते हैं तो भारत में ही नहीं पूरे विश्व में उनकी एक अलग पहचान है ये उनका एक डायमेंशन है जो हमारे जो लोग है एटोमिक एनर्जी के बी आर सी के या जो भी यूनिट्स है वो सब जानते हैं लेकिन उनका और भी कुछ व्यक्तित्व के बारे में बताना चाहूंगा कि जो शायद बहुत लोग नहीं जानते होंगे जैसे कि अगर मैं हमारे दिया की बात करूं तो जब हमारा नया नया शुरुआत हुआ था दो हजार सात आठ में तब सब आप आए थे ब्लड डोनेशन कैंप में और आपने जो हमको मोटिवेशन दिया एनकरेजमेंट दिया वॉल्टियर्स को उसके बाद अनेक तरह की एक्टिविटी आगे बढ़ी और आप 2011 में जो डॉक्टर प्रणब पंडा जी के साथ प्रोग्राम हुआ दादर में हुआ था गायत्री संध्या का जिसमें आपकी उपस्थिति थी और आपने विज्ञान और अध्यात्म उस टॉपिक पर बहुत ही अच्छा व्यक्तित्व दिया था साथ में जब भी आप हमको मिलते हैं तो हमको समाज में अच्छी एक्टिविटी उसके लिए प्रेरित करते रहते हैं आपको बहुत लोग बहुत अच्छे वक्ता स्पीकर के नाते जानते हैं कि बैनर्जी सर जब आते हैं तो उनके वक्त हमको सुनने के लिए आना है उनकी जो सोच है उनका विचार है वक्तव्य है बहुत लोग जानने का प्रयत्न करते हैं मुझे अभी भी याद है अनुशक्ति नगर में उस टाइम पे जब आप डायरेक्टर थे यहाँ तो हर रोज सुबह आप वॉक करने निकलते थे तो आपको देख के कितने सारे लोगों ने वॉकिंग शुरू किया था तो आप देखा जाए तो स्पिरिचुअल बात करो सोशल बात करो तो अनेक तरह से हमारे सबके प्रेरणाप्रद रहे हैं आप सबका आज ज्ञान सभा में अधिक स्वागत है और प्रणाम है मैं ज्ञान सभा की बात करूं तो हमारे जो गुरुदेव थे श्रीराम शर्मा आचार्य जिन्होंने अपने जीवन में लगभग साढ़े तीन हजार पुस्तकें लिखी थी और उन्होंने एक योजना बनाई थी युग निर्माण योजना कैसे करेंगे युग निर्माण तो विचार क्रांति अभियान से कि समाज का हर वर्ग चाहे वो वैज्ञानिक हो चाहे वो सोशल रिफॉर्मर हो चाहे वो स्टूडेंट हो चाहे वो पोइट हो कोई भी फील्ड का हो वो जब उसकी थिंकिंग सही होगी और अब देश में अपना योगदान देगा तो ये युग अवश्य बदलेगा उसी को आगे लेते हुए ये जो ज्ञान सभा है उसका निर्माण हुआ है ये एक विचार मंच है जिसमें हम लोग अलग अलग व्यक्तित्व भारत के रहे उनको बुलाते हैं और उनके अनुभव उनके विचार वो लोग शेयर करते हैं तो इसके द्वारा समाज का यूथ है और बहुत सारे व्यक्ति है उनसे प्रेरणा लेते हैं और अपने जीवन में आगे बढ़ते हैं और हमारा जो मेन गोल है व्यक्ति निर्माण का और समाज निर्माण का वो प्रक्रिया अनवरत चल रही है इसी के उपलक्ष्य में सर आज आपको हमने इनवाइट किया है कि जो ऑलरेडी काम कर रहा है साइंटिफिक फील्ड में या जो स्टूडेंट्स है जो चाहते हैं कि हम इस फील्ड में आगे जाए या जो लोग आपके साथ बहुत सारा काम कर चुके हैं वो सबके जीवन में एक ऐसी प्रेरणा मिले कि ये जो साइंटिफिक करियर है उससे किस तरह से आगे बढ़ाए आपके बहुत अनुभव रहे है आपका इतना लंबा करियर रहा है तो आज इस प्रोग्राम के माध्यम से मैं आपको इन्वाइट करना चाहूंगा स्टेज पे कि आप जो साइंटिफिक करियर टॉपिक है उनको आप इंस्पायर करें मोटिवेट करें थैंक यू सर इसके बाद ये जो स्टेज है मैं आपको प्रदान करता हूं आप आगे बढ़ाएं उसको नमस्कार हितेश जोशी ये मेरा सौभाग्य है जो आपका दिया मुंबई ज्ञान सभा में भाग लेने के लिए आई हैव चोजन द टॉपिक ऑन द डेमा इन साइंटिफिक करियर uh it's not a very formal presentation it's mostly based on my personal experience in uh, in the scientific field it's not just my personal experience but i've also seen many careers to grow and so i will try to explain the dilemma that we face and also sometimes even give suggestions that how do we come out of this dilemma and choose a path for going forward so let me start uh typically i would expect to cover in about 45 50 minutes so let us try right away 
So this is an important question that people may say, why dilemma? Because I think this kind of a dilemma is not so much there in any, any other profession. In science particularly, there's a big dilemma. Why? When somebody enters the discipline of science, either in the college level or in the professional level, he has a knowledge of his own background, his own interest. Some people will say that I like mathematics. Some students will say that my interest is more in understanding physical concepts. Some are very particularly interested in chemistry or biology, things like that. That is a kind of a background and also the inclinations. So some people have an inclination to do things with their hand, make new things, try out various mechanical or other kind of an engineering models. So that is an inclination. So we have our own academic background. We, as we join, we have our inclinations to go into any of these directions in, in science or scientific disciplines. And then one starts also with an ambition. I'm coming to that point just a, another slide later. But there are also many issues like we know that say computer science or information science has uh, assumed a very prominent place in the lives of the people today. So that becomes a fashionable area, computer science. Many come to that mainly following that fashion without knowing what exactly is computer science. So it's very important that we should know a little more than just follow the fashion. There's also fantasy in science. We see science fiction movies. We have experienced in one generation the advancement of science which has changed the world completely. So there are many fantastic things and many things which are more fantasy. And uh, you expect that kind of thing to happen as you take up the, your, your professional career or your academic career in science. So there are different driving forces for us to enter the scientific discipline. In a very crude manner, if we say, many feel that as you enter a scientific uh, career, the chances of getting a secured career is good, either in, in academics, in institutes, or in some research establishments, or even in industry where science is a primary force. And one can see that there's a good, there's a path, well laid out path of assured and rapid career advancement, if you of course do well. That is, you can be a research fellow, you can be an assistant professor to associate professor to full professor. I also know in, in today's participation, there's a large number of BRC participants. So they know that they have a possibility of promotion from, and the promotion prospects or promotion, the, the kind of uh, grades are given in scientific officer, A, B, C, D, like that. So then I'm calling it alphabet race in BRC. So that we are running for an alphabet race. Many come to science with an ambition that one day I'll be able to make a notable contribution, which will be seen not just in the immediate environment, but globally. That what I do has made a permanent mark in the advancement of science, in the advancement of human society. There are people, in fact, I've met many of them, who even at a very young age has a big ambition of uh, some curiosity. He has got some questions in their mind and they want to sort of solve that question by doing science. Some of them are well-trained. So they have, so particularly those who are coming after their masters in science or in technology, they know that they have already achieved in a certain level of education and they think of really working on towards something, something major and make a big discovery or, or even satisfy the curiosity. I want to know about this. I said so that curiosity, satisfying a curiosity. 
there are also many laurels in science. You can get many awards, recognition from the country, from abroad. So that's also, it's like just like in sports. Majority of the people who, who uh, go in sports, you'll find that on one side, they love sports, they like to do it. They, they want to get engaged in sports and only then you can do the best in that. But parallelly, they also feel that, I, okay, I will be making a, a record in any other parameters, it could be in the run scored or the wickets taken or the or the speediest movement or highest jump, any of these. Similarly, in science also, there are possibilities of making this kind of, I wouldn't call it records, but at least kind of a uh, landmarks that you have achieved some landmark, which, uh, which gives you a recognition, which gives you recognition worldwide. So that's also another major driving force for people to come for that science. If you are doing well, you can also go to higher and higher level of leadership position. One day one can become a head of a department or one can become even a director of an institute. Now at the very young age, you don't know whether your, your destiny is for reaching those. But still there are many people who has this ambition right in the, at the young age and can finally, many of them reach there, many of them do not reach there, but that doesn't really matter. That's what I'm going to come and tell you. And finally, there are also many people who see the problems existing in the national level or even international level. Today, you know, the COVID pandemic has affected the whole world. So I think a very large number of young people, they feel, can I not do something from where we can get the strength to come out of this kind of a pandemic situation? The pandemic has not happened over a, over a century now. So all of our generation, we have never seen a situation of this kind that the whole world has become sort of stopped. So now the question is, this is one cause. There are other cause of hunger, cause of trust that you don't have water to drink. You have no suitable habitat for live. There are many problems that one faces. And we see that in society. Is it not possible to solve them by science? So these are different kinds of ambitions. But sometimes doing one piece of science, you can achieve many of them together. Let us see. So first, let us take in a kind of a caricature, not really a, that somebody wants to do a science in such a way that I have total independence. I can start a research in, in a manner it's totally original in my own thinking. So a young person in the graduate school, he has that sort of an ambition. Then I'll do something which is totally novel. Nobody has touched that. Or I'll crack a problem which has not been done. Not just in decades, but sometime in centuries. So with that, he starts his ambition. He then becomes a student. He has to work with a professor. Now, he thinks that that type of a freedom of do, doing anything I like is not possible. He has to be, he has to listen to his professor, who is his mentor, who is giving him the research problem to work on. And his professor is again dependent on a research project for which he has got the money. So he is bound by those boundary conditions that I can select a particular area of activity and focused activity and work on that. By science, you know, Vigyan in, in Sanskrit is a Vishesh Gyan. It's not just a Gyan in, 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 uh, uh, in general, but something very specific on a specific subject with a very focused attention. So doing science itself means that you have to work in a focused manner and not in a dispersed manner. So as a student, as a research student, he has to concentrate on something very, very narrow. You cannot solve the problem of humanity while you are a student or even as a senior person. So he understands that, that you have to, you cannot have all that ambition that we had at an early age when you are not matured, but you have to work in a disciplined manner, taking the advice of your advisor and go ahead in that direction. He finishes his PhD. Then he 
he becomes an assistant professor in an institute, then he has to also follow certain limitations or some boundary conditions, which are these, that he has to finally get money for doing the research. And that money giver, whoever it is, a fund giving agency, they say that you have to work for a particular area of activity and then only you'll get money. And he needs to collect that money, then work for his projects, have students, and so that all that is necessary for what? For finally getting a tenure for a professor. Fortunately, in our country, this getting tenure problem is rather less. And in, in places like in Baba Atomic Research Center, if you join as a scientific officer, you already get a tenure for your life, for your, till your retirement. So there's a rather easy, but internationally, this uh, getting a tenure for your service itself is a major challenge for which again you have some restriction of choosing your subject, you have to focus it. Then again, you have to, as a tenured professor, you need to research only where, in the areas where you get money. Here again, I would say that in India, we have a little relaxed condition in this, and quite often that we have a certain degree of freedom because our uh, most of our research is funded from the government, and we have this kind of a freedom much more than what others in our profession enjoy elsewhere in the world. Then when he's emeritus professor, he doesn't depend on any money. Then he thinks that, yes, now I can do the research, whatever I want. And then finally research in peace. So this is only a kind of a, that we don't have as much freedom as we originally feel in the beginning. Please remember that. Now, Science can be classified in many manner, but I'm trying to do it in a very broad way. One is curiosity driven. I have a certain curiosity. I want to know something, so I'm doing it. Other side is I'm doing it for a specific application motive. So what is curiosity driven? Somebody can ask a very, very fundamental question, very fundamental origin and evol evolution of universe. Where from all that has happened, universe has created. We know today there's about 14 billion years back, universe was created. How exactly it created? What happened in the first few seconds or first few even milliseconds of the creation of the universe? How exactly all these elements got created? How these different planetary system, the different galaxies got created? Very major question, very difficult to answer, but we are getting some glimpse of that in the today's scientific results. And there are many ways of even checking that. Some are working towards unification of forces in nature. We see different kinds of forces, electromagnetic forces, gravitational forces, weak forces, strong forces, all that kind of forces that we see. Is there any kind of a common, one single type of force which unifies all of this? Einstein started the inquiry on that. Answer has not been found as yet. There are many people who have been working towards that to find, is there a process of unification of forces? In biology, one of the biggest mystery is the origin and of life. How exactly life was created? How exactly the, the changes that has happened in the living systems or living bodies? over a period, all that process of evolution, understanding that. Again, this pandemic has shown that we are not just, we cannot say that it's the whole, whole earth, our own planet is only, for, is only for human beings. No, it is the, the, the uh, kind of a harmonic state in a, in a harmony. All these different living matter in the whole world are connected. And if this harmony is slightly disturbed, the whole world can get affected. So one needs to consider the biodiversity and the keeping that biodiversity to and, and, and also to maintain that harmony. There are many issues on energy conversion. So these are just some examples. Now, I, I would also make my presentation to an extent personal because it's not just uh, important to tell generally. See, when I started my career, I was not working in any of these kind of a very fundamental issues, which I've just now described, but I started working on something very narrow. What is that? In a simple way, if I ask that question, that question was why and how one form of matter changes to another. 
say from a solid to liquid or liquid to glass or one type of crystal structure to another, these kind of questions. And that's also very fundamental because you don't know really at that stage that these changes that is brought about, how, what's, the, what's its utility? Utility has plenty, but you can't start with that. You start understanding that these are the why and hows of changes that happen in the, in the uh, all non-living matter, not living matter, because I, I was not working on the biology side, so it's mostly on the non-living matter. On the other side, the application-driven projects are, you can work for, say, entire thing. Today, I'll talk of our food, water supply, energy. All this comes from the application of science. But to control our environment, to even understand our weather pattern, even sometimes necessary to even control the weather. So all these are application-driven science. You have to work on shelters, habitat, transportation, all means of transportation from the steam engine to today's jet engines. Everything is transportation, communication, connecting people. As you know that worldwide today we can connect people only through the science. Healthcare, today healthcare is 100% dependent on, the, on, on science, of variety of science. All our entertainment, information, as I mentioned, information science is pervading our lives in every aspect. In the whole day, you find that you are either sitting in front of your computer or a cell phone and doing things, and all services that you get, that also is related to science. So application, the driving force is either I go to the application or to the curiosity. So this is one big dilemma. Science, in a true sense, is for just meeting your curiosity in the true sense. But science also has the other application, other areas in which you apply and not only make your own personal life comfortable, but you make others' lives comfortable. As you join any place, whether you join a academic institution or research institute, you have a, you work in a, let us take you work in a small research group. Now there are different possibilities. One possibility is that research group has already established program. So that is good because if it is there, then you don't have to hunt for a, pro a problem. See, it's always very easy to say that, oh, you find out your own problem and work, but it is not, not only it is not easy, most of the time, if you do that, you actually spend a lot of time in identifying a suitable scientific problem in which you should work. It's the past experience of your predecessors which helps you in identifying that what is good in science, what I can do and get some meaningful results within a short time, but time is limited. Your career life is typically of the order of 40 years. No, 40 years, you have to do something, but you don't get 40 years right away. You only get, you to think of a, a couple of years within which you have to get some results. So working in an established program is always little easier compared to if you want to do what you call the green field area. Nothing is known, I'm open and I can select something. There again, one has to identify a few things. One is a short term goal. What I can achieve even today, every scientist every day should have a plan that I'm going to achieve this today. And if you don't have that, your day, that particular day will be wasted. So you have to have a short term plan, a day to day plan, a weekly plan, a monthly plan, a year plan, and also have a long term plan. Because this is not just every day I change my plan. So the short term plans are connected in such a way that finally I achieve a long term plan, long term goal. Facility driven. You are working in a group, say if you are doing experimental work, so there are certain facilities available with you. So you know that you are limited by this availability of the facility. You can, of course, add on to this facility. But within that, whatever is possible to do, that one has to, one has to try to get that done. And then some are self-initiated programs, as I mentioned, that if it is to be done only ab initio from one has to do it all on his own, then you need very strong conviction and competence. Otherwise, the chances of failure is very high. The science is also not that whatever you do, you'll get a result. No, most many a time, many a time your work will not finally give you any meaningful result. So one has to be careful in finally seeing that how best I can utilize um, uh, the effort, the planning should be such. And finally, in a very large majority of the cases, I would say 
that uh, the clear definition of the problem is not done by the scientists and that is why their goal becomes rather diffuse and not clear and then at the end of a period maybe two years maybe five years you see we have not really gained much in the scientific activity this is why one has to do an introspection constant introspection that what i'm doing am i in the right track or not if you're not in the right track you have to change your track so this is why it is most important for everybody who is pursuing science to see that whether he is in the end this self correction method is absolutely essential you can be you can be helped by others particularly your supervisor or mentor but often it is more from your own you have to identify that whether the path that you have chosen is uh, taking you forward or not taking you forward I start with some simple examples because everybody is now, I think all the people who are sitting for this webinar must be having a cell phone close to him so that you have anything that comes, it, one uh, ring comes and immediately you can address to that. So how did all, all this happen? See, I'm a person of a, um, earlier generation, I would say. So I didn't see this. I mean, in the, in the 80s, there was nothing like a cell phone. It's only in the 90s it started. And today we have the smartphones and we can do, it's a real revolution. And not only in technology, in our lifestyle. What is today a cell phone is, it's actually a, a, a part of our body. And without that, you can't even live. So it has come to that stage. And as you can see, this happened because of a few technological revolution. One on information technology. Second is on miniaturization. And third, in the smartphone particularly, display cum sensors let us go forward but if i ask you this simple question all that you are seeing that you are connected with the rest of the world not just your local area it's all because only one important thing that wireless communication is possible and it is also seen that wireless communication by a satellite can can do this job as long as the satellite communication was not there, contacting distant uh, persons through your phone was not possible. Today that is possible. And at a remarkable speed, particularly during this pandemic, it is seen that so many things are going online and it's only possible only because of the extremely high speed in which we can transfer information. Now, if I ask you that who discovered wireless communication? Of course, this is one of the weakness of the the video uh, conferencing, I can't get your answer. But I can assure you, I mean, I'm more or less sure that very few of them know the answer of this, that who has discovered wireless communication. Okay, I give you the answer. Answer it is, actually it is done by an Indian scientist. He was there between 1858 to 1937. The scientist, but also had engineering skill. He was not rewarded. The reward went to uh, G. Marconi. Everybody knows Marconi's name, that he is the person who invented. But today, the USA based IEEE, International Electrical and Electronics Engineering Institute, Institute of Electronics and Ele Electrical Engineers, they have proved that the century old suspicion amongst academics that the pioneer of wireless radio communication was Professor Jagadish Chandra Bose at University of Kolkata and not Marconi. Now, a few historical points. He demonstrated in 1895 by remote signaling. If anybody visits uh, the Kolkata's Boshu Bigyan Mandir, that is the institute, Bose Institute it's called, uh, in Kolkata, after the name of Jagdish Bose, they have a, an exhibition center. There you can see that there are a few rooms and you can communicate the Bose, the Jagdish Bose, what he discovered is, is, is demonstrated there that you can actually communicate from one room to the other. That is how he start first shown that. But when he did that, he also, he also did that in, in Europe. Those days he, he was going for lecture tours, but also he had a demonstration unit with him and he was doing that. So this uh, Marconi is very famous uh, 
Salisbury Plain demonstration is there, 1897. It's a couple of years before that, actually he showed that signal can be transferred from one place to another without the help of a wire. Copper wire is not needed. You can do by, by um, wireless communication. So that was the beginning. He also did some fantastic things like groundbreaking work on the effect of electromagnetic radiation on the growth of a plant. That is a plant has life. He showed that by also the use of effective electromagnetic radiation on plant growth. Research into electromagnetic waves, use development of innovative microwave components. And he also started using semiconductors. It, so definitely, he, and he did all this in early 1900s. So imagine about 50 years ahead of his time. And of course, in the country that recognition is there, but uh, internationally, the recognition has not been uh, as much as it should have been. Discovered that atmosphere is responsible for blocking short wavelength radio wave. In fact, uh, this is another reason why the short wavelength uh, transmission was not possible. But later on, again, there are many. There's a very interesting story behind it. So this is the kind of a development in the micro, in the my, uh, wireless communication. But is this uh, totally new? Now, if you ask that question, there's a very interesting book called Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Clark Maxwell, a mathematician originally, in 1865, he did a set of mathematics, very abstruse mathematic calculations, and published a treatise in 1873. So look at this, this is 1895. So it is about 22 years before that, he did the mathematics. And uh, this A.J. Smith of Oxford said that it's a, it's a kind of a resource of pure mathematics, no doubt. 87, 88, another person, Heinrich Hertz. You know, we call the frequencies 50 Hertz. That is that Heinrich Hertz. So he advanced this field with a scientific problem still remaining the detection and demonstration of electromagnetic waves, which is a basic, that these are the carriers of wireless signals. So that, so neither Maxwell or nor Hertz had any concern about the utility of the work, that this would be used for signal transfer, this would be used for communication. He, they had no knowledge, no such thought even entered their minds. But Hertz and Maxwell could not invent, they did, they are not inventors, but they are useless theoretical work. I'm using the word useless theoretical work created new means of wireless communication. And today, whatever you are seeing, all that whole world gets connected by communication, by wireless communication, satellite communication. The fundamentals of that was done way back in 1865. So what is useless and what is useful is rather difficult. So one has to be patient to understand this patient sometime is over a century. You can see that how the communication can change. I come to the evolution of communication technology once again, because even the absolutely young people today, they may not even know what's a telegraph, because telegraph has been abolished now in the world. But we have seen telegraph, we have seen telephone, radio, television, personal computer, mobile phone, cloud, what next? Maybe quantum computing will come soon. So this is how the whole thing is evolving. Same thing is in the miniaturization you know, trans, trans, transition of memory devices. Memory devices changes from the magnetic tape in today's very, very small, this cloud backup present or SD card and all that. So you know that in a, in a chip, in a silicon transistor, only one transistor was in 1950s. If you can make one transistor in a chip, that was great. Today you have over a billion transistors. What I've given is 592 million, that's in 2000. But today, I think it's more. It's even a billion transistor is there in a chip. So today, what, what is our situation? We are heavily depending on imported technologies. Very limited cap uh, cap capabilities in production of basic materials. Extremely difficult to stand technology. And today, if you want to even start a business on that, we find we are nowhere. We just can't make our own. We have to depend on foreign collaboration or technology that we get. Why is it so that why we can't have our own system of say a, a personal computer or a cell phone? It's very clear. If you look at these, the dependence of, if you look at in, in your home around, see everything around, whether you have a refrigerator, a printer, microwave, washing machine, a pen drive, a computer. The technology of this is not Indian, none of them. 
So whatever you have, whatever you are having in your own environment, you'll see that everything is imported, technology-wise. Maybe it's being manufactured in the country. That is separate. But we are not that bad. See, refrigerator in 1950s, Indian refrigerator was available. In many things, like photocopy machine, the first photocopy machine that we had, we have seen, was Indian. That was not foreign. But we could not stand the competition. That's again because of the lack of that scientific research to development of technology, the whole chain was not established. In nuclear power, at least we can be saying that very proudly, that the entire thing is Indian, entire thing. So here we are not depending on somebody else giving us something, some technology, and then only we can do it, no. So that, why is it possible? It was possible, okay, I'll come to that point a little later, but then you try to understand that Technology deployment has many issues. Science and engineering is a basically creating ideas. But the idea alone will not give you a product. You need innovations. What is innovation? Innovation is not invention. Innovation is selecting and combining these ideas to create products. And if you do that, so it's a selection and combination of idea with, which gives you the innovation. Similarly, science and engineering, that innovation again can make it to push from the developer and pull from the market get it to deployment and distribution, finally deliver it to the users. And there's a continuous upgradation to face competition. If you don't have that, the whole cycle, if it is not there, then you cannot stand any competition. Oh, this is common. Okay, science and so creation and adoption of new scientific techniques and implementation of technology in societal sector are the key to national prosperity. If you want national prosperity, if you want to be many of these things yourself in the same country, you need this combination. Again, I'm putting a triangle which is similar. So innovation is competition driven, deployment is market driven, and in between, basically you have a large creation of jobs, whereas knowledge, which is scholarship driven, can give you innovation. And that is a creation of usable knowledge. And finally, the knowledge and deployment gives you the creation of value. Value is also important for the society. So this is a this is all integrated. So national prosperity depends on each of these components. I'll give one very interesting example: solar energy. We have made a fantastic growth. I think this is even world never knew or could never imagine that it's possible for India to do that. We have now about 36.6 gigawatt, thousand megawatt, 36,000 megawatt in 2020. And our target is 100 gigawatt by 2022. And most likely, in fact, I think it is almost certainly we can say that we'll be reaching this number, 100 gigawatt by 2022. And in 2010, we had nothing from there to 100 gigawatt. It's a fantastic achievement. And there are many, many places where this is happening. So solar energy growth is fantastic. I'll show you another thing. Manufacturing capacity of photovoltaic cell in India. The cells, the install capacity and utilized capacity even is lower because all those companies who started working on the solar cells in the country, they're not making profit. Modules, you see again, the install capacity is higher than utilized capacity. No manufacturing base for polysilicon ingots and wafers. You know how much silicon India produces? Zero. So all that has happened is with the imported technology. Lack of integrated setups, unfavorable economics of scale, Today you can't, if you, even if you do it, you can't be able to compete. Higher cost of capital. So these are issues. Bhava had a little different vision. If you want to do nuclear energy, you can also buy electro, uh, the fuel from say, uranium from outside. He didn't do that. He thought that we have to do the totality. You get your uranium from the Indian mines, develop entire technology, get not just the material, but the entire technology of the reactor, indigenous reactor, the entire fuel cycle. And also the emphasis is always on the nuclear material. As you can see that today we are in the pressurized heavy water reactor technology. India is uh, uh, one major, Canada and India, the two custodian of this technology. And we have a, a large program, but this, this is nothing compared to what we have done in solar energy. But here it is 100% indigenous. So you can see that this is the, so here you can see the completely self, complete self-sufficiency in fuel cycle. The entire thing is done within the country. We are not dependent anyway 
to outside. Same thing is done for the fast reactor. We have been running a fast reactor since uh, 1985, and some of the remarkable features like uh, uh, we can we can make our own fuel. We use them, and we the fuel also has performed exceedingly in the test reactor. And we are waiting for the final installation or final commissioning of the prototype fast breeder reactor. This is taking a little longer than expected time because of many issues. This is the first uh, unit which is coming up, but it is ready in all respect. In spite of that, it's taking time to get started. And we have to also see that how we handle the waste. Nuclear waste is one of the most serious concern in, in the nuclear technology as a whole. And we have today a, uh, a complete um, sort of wherewithals in handling the nuclear waste. We also can reprocess and we get that uh, the plutonium out of the reprocessed fuel and use it for the fast reactor. Today, install capacity is only 6,780 megawatt. That is 6.7 gigawatt compared to the, the, the solar capacity of already 36 gigawatt. So it's only one, um, one fifth of the kind of a solar capacity. But the total electricity produced per year, if you see, is not that low because here we have a very high capacity factor. In solar, just because sun doesn't shine the whole day and the efficiency of the conversion is low, the capacity that we get is very low. It's only of the 20%. So here is one example to show. And we must not, actually everywhere I think a misconception is there that the nuclear versus solar. No, it is not nuclear versus solar. Solar and nuclear are complementary. One primary energy sources are these, solar, wind, and nuclear. And if you look at that, the distributed, one is a distributed uh, source of energy and one is a concentrated source of energy. Nuclear is a concentrated source. Why I'm telling that is shown in this slide. So if you want to get something like 10,000 megawatt installation for wind, you require 5,000 square kilometer area. For case of uh, solar, you need 400 to 500 square kilometer area. In nuclear, you can get about 10,000 megawatt installation in a small area, this is the Kaiga picture, as small as about two square kilometers, you can produce that much of energy. It is concentrated and continuous. And this is distributed and intermittent because neither the wind nor the solar energy can be con continuous. And then another picture in the same is that the, if you look at the capacity factor, nuclear can reach 90%. In fact, is worldwide average is over 80%. Wind and solar are in the range of 20 to 25%. So that's why they're complementary. You need distributed form of energy. You also need a continuous energy supply to meet particularly what is known as a base load through nuclear. And uh, okay, I just want to display that we have a world record for longest duration of continuous operation in the Skyga plant, uh, 941 days. And that's, uh, we are all proud of that kind of a world record. Okay, now this is one aspect of it. Next aspect is about the societal part. So when a scientist uh, do some work in the laboratory, if he remembers this Gandhiji statement, that before you do anything, stop and recall the face of the poorest, the most helpless destitute person you have seen, and ask yourself, is what I'm about to do going to help her? So when you talk of motivation, why you do the science, why do you do the research? This could be one question which you can ask to yourself and see whether you have really done something. Now, I'll tell you that our science, what it has done for this country is not negligible. Many times we think that, oh, scientists have done nothing. It's not that. In the 1950 to 90 area, we had tremendous food shortage. We had to buy food from outside at a very heavy price, widespread poverty, social inequities, low rate of employment, unfavorable trade balance, lack of technology, culture, very weak infrastructure. This is the starting. We're not that bad today. Energy, environment, and climate change, but the, change, the, the kind of problems have changed. Food and milk shortage. Today, we are one of the largest producers of food. We are the best, highest milk producers in the world. Technology denials, we have, we are managing in strategic sectors. Communication and infrastructure, we are no less compared to any other place. So like that, in many areas that we are, we are we have made progress and that progress has been done because of science. So you cannot say that the scientists have failed the society. No, 
competitive world economy and trade impact, the fundamentals of scientific solutions, and flow of solution sciences, global and wide range. Okay. I'll come to some problems. Some problem is that in the mission mode agencies like atomic energy, space, and other, we are we have focused on self-reliance. And uh, now the techno globalization has come, and there'll be a pressure that uh, you also have to globalize. So there are again, it's a debate, and I don't want to enter into this debate today. But the question is that yes, you may need a, a kind of a globalized approach so that you can grow faster. It's a very important point. In government R&D bodies, they have to balance between the funding, between the what is called the solution-driven science, that is science which gives you a solution for a social problem, or a curiosity-driven science, development of market-driven technology and competition-linked innovation system. In academic se sector, challenged by need of expanding manifold in education without dilution of excellence and loss of focus on research. I can just tell you that one important thing that today, a very large number of students are going abroad, even in undergraduate education. And uh, I was told, I don't know exactly is correct or not, that the Indian spending money for their children's education abroad amounts to something like $10 billion. So imagine that the kind of expenses that we do for that, and uh, which is really very large. So there are many issues on academic sector. Socioeconomic ministries are seeking solutions from science anywhere, whether it's for fast railway track or uh, better communication, all these things, better roads, better irrigation, industrial research competition between, as I said, that if you have an in-house development, like our refrigerator industry, which was quite promising at some, some stage earlier, today, all of them are going for imported technologies. Science intervention and the example, see, we had green revolution resulted in 130 million ton Yield per unit has changed, improved by 30%. Crop area has improved 7% to 22%. New dams created a large irrigation area. Growth also in agriculture-based industry. India paid back all World Bank loan. And that is why we have improved credit worthiness. Indian farmers invited to other countries for demonstrating green revolution elsewhere. In milk, as I mentioned, from 1992, 2010-11, but the India today, India is the largest producer of milk. But per capita availability is still, still lower. It's about 269 grams per day, and world average is 286 grams. Then you come to space technology to revolutionize okay, uh, the in communication and information. I think I don't have to repeat to you. All of you are using this. Now, there is a kind of a, uh, some people think that inclusive, this kind of growth in science, you require what is called that, uh, innovations by artisans, which is important. I'm not denying that innovation by artisans is not important. That's also science. But the question is, it's not the formal science that we think of. See, because there's a word used in 70s called appropriate technology. That India should develop a, 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 a rubber tire in a bullock cart. That's called appropriate technology. So it's kind of a jugad. The jugad part of it, it's a frugal, flexible, inclusive, no doubt, but strictly speaking, a scientist uh, uh, trained in science is not some, there are many people who can do this. And if they do it for the good for the, for the society, let them do it. But we cannot bring the science to this level so that we don't advance in the, in the frontier of science, but do these kind of jugad work. That I think, in my opinion, is not something which is desirable. Now I come to one very important point that is about the individual creativity and group achievements. No scientific discovery can come without the dedicated involvement and creative work from the scientists. But serendipity favors trained minds. So you may say that I got it by only by a fluke. I get it only by chance. But the chance will be favoring people who are trained, who is not trained in not. Trained. Modern science heavily depends on cooperative research. It's not individual. Individual, how much you can do? If you really want to make a mark, you need, yeah, there's a need for doing cooperative research. Technology development necessarily involves group activities. An effective combination of individual creativity and group effort can bring success. So both needs to be natural. You cannot say individual creativity is not necessary. We do only the group effort. No, you have to have these two things in a balanced way to achieve the success. See, this is a Louis Pasteur. We are talking of vaccination. He is the father of all vaccination. He says that chance favors prepared mind. 
And that's very important for us to remember. So in career plan, we think of a career plan that I'll go like this as is by, by a cartoon as I'm showing that you have a path to advance. But as you go forward, there may be a problem. There may be some, um, you, you don't go exactly in the, in the path as you're going. And uh, so you may have to adjust to a new situation. Compatibility issues are there. Lack of mobility for switching. Our, one of the weakness of our system is that we are rather, we stick to one particular model. Don't try to change it, it's rigidity. Rigidity is not good or complacent. Sometimes you are very complacent. Oh, it's very nice going on. No, but to continuously question is the right path or am I change my path accordingly? I can go further. So internal aspiration of a person and external circumstances, there may be a conflict. And this conflict resolution is also part of your career. Mid-course adjustment. You have to do mid-course adjustments. Then there are alternative paths for the growth. This could be different alternative paths. You have to think that which is the, so adopting the path of least, least resistance is of course simple, but accepting difficult tasks and big challenges is something which can finally give you a very high reward. Sometimes we go for doing, very looking for quick results. That is, but instead of that, if we think of a lasting contribution of the sustained effort is something what has to, we have to see that. Similarly, career profile, we know that science requires uh, a single-minded approach. Just for a little bit. So you need to focus attention, generate a deep expertise in a single area, and go in that direction. Deeper understanding of a narrow area of a higher recognition, no doubt. But in today's context, you need a deep expertise. But at the same time, you also must know the applications of a various knowledge base. So broadening experience base and network, act as an adaptable problem solver rather than a technical expert with a very narrow sliver of knowledge. It's, it's one very nice statement. It's not enough to be expert on a specific topic. Today's scientists also need to be able to apply their knowledge. Depth versus width is a very, very important uh, dilemma that one has. So essential elements in science and technology. Depth of understanding, detailing design. Everywhere you find that detail. Detail is a devil is in the detail. In the overall sense, you may find everything fine. But you need to go to the depth. You have to have a detailing in design, rigor in analysis, not some simple analysis. Go for the deepest of the rigor in the analysis, accuracy in instrumentation, precision in measurements, meticulous observation, all observation, good or bad, you have to observe properly and objectivity in reporting. Don't fudge any information that you're seeing because you may miss something very important that one has to report. On the implementation of the, or the technology, you need combination of ideas from different disciplines, a very broad knowledge base, cooperative teamwork, mutual appreciation, one and understand each other's work and have appreciation, time bound implementation. So one side, depth versus width, If you say that if you have to get this, then you are making a jack of all trades, master of none. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you become jack of many trades, but master of some. You must have a in-depth understanding of something. At the same time, you have something where you have the width. Now, recognition in science comes from, science as a KDR comes from, in, just like in sports or artists, say a badminton player cannot play cricket. Okay, so you need to definitely focus on that. And prevailing value system often gives priority to individual excellence and not to the group performance. But a overall, if you want to bring science to the society, the fruits of science to the society, you need a balance between the nurturing of individual excellence along with promoting group activities. Again, as you know that you have individual games and group games. In group game, it is not just in one particular area you, suc you, you succeed, you have to have the overall feature, which you must be watching in most of the sports that you watch, particularly a game like cricket or football. So academic environment, I think one important point, which that science, if we say that after doing my MSc or the PhD, education is over. That will be a very, very wrong step. 
in in scientific thing you have to continuously learn learn till you to till, till you finish your career every day is a day of learning so continuously to learn so if you are in an academic environment you may be doing a scientific research work but you are in an academic environment so that you can reach enrich yourself from the knowledge from your others from your colleagues from different courses so that is a extremely important thing for anybody for young researchers to select from a wide range of activities for mature professional it is important for decisive step at critical points in the career to remain focused or to widen their horizon depending on their taste and accomplishment and providing opportunities for learning a lifelong process so hierarchy of official position can be made irrelevant that's not so important as this continuous learning process so that like in like in atomic energy we have this homi baba national institute where one of the main goal of this is to provide a lifelong learning opportunity and one must utilize that one must promote that he may be also be contributing in, in form of a teacher to to propagate that knowledge to many of his colleagues so one has to understand that what's going on elsewhere but without losing your focus so brc and sister units are responsible repository of scientific ideas and facility it's not just brc you can go to in one of the iits you go it's a repository but how much time we spend to try to see that what is going on elsewhere very rarely even the next door neighbor you don't know what he's doing many research groups sometimes are engaged in similar and close related field but we we sort of refuse to learn from each other and uh, we sometimes create barrier because we have to break this barrier we should work as collaborators as much as possible and not as competitors and synergy that can lead to rewards beyond expectation so we have a long career about 40 years plenty of opportunities to explore a variety of scientific fields there's no necessity of remaining extremely confined to a very narrow area unless it is highly rewarding or relevant then you do you have a concentrated way and mobility outside the comfort zone many scientists fall into this group of remaining within the comfort zone comfort zone is easy i can just keep on changing a few parameters or a few simple experiment conditions and uh, uh, make yet another paper but that is not science science is always the curiosity that i have to do something new it's not just repeating the same thing over and over again i conclude my thing by on the basis of this that uh, dr chidambaram used the word directed basic research what is directed basic research see the basic research is undoubtedly essential for scientists to pursue but by itself it cannot give prosperity to a society so if you want to advance the society then there is a necessity of uh, directed basic research to develop new knowledge and to provide the ability to appropriate knowledge developed in other countries and uh, have a kind of a coherent synergy between them so that <coughs> you you deliver things to the society to the goods of the society so that is how we can eventually develop into a knowledge economy and that's the only way a country of 1.2 or 1.3 billion people we cannot remain independent remain dependent continuously on others both in science and technology and we must do it all our own and that is the only way economic prosperity and uh, alleviation of the poverty from this country can be achieved thank you very much for listening